Arguably the greatest moment in Star Trek The Next Generation, and certainly its most influential, remains the two-part episode that ended Season 3 and started Season 4. The Best of Both Worlds is an ambitious, confident action-adventure with daring character twists, jaw-dropping spectacle, and dramatic stakes beyond anything seen before. It's no exaggeration to say that this two-parter redefined what was possible in Star Trek and even modern television at the time. Even 40 years later, it's still so influential that it served as a direct jumping-off point for new stories. This episode marked a significant turning point for the new era of Star Trek, so much so that even the title seems to have a meta-meaning. You see, the show had a rocky start with its early seasons. There were good episodes in season 1 and 2, but the third season of The Next Generation felt like a big upswing in overall quality. There were far fewer stories that felt like leftovers from the original series, and despite some misfires, there were some compelling ideas and elements that meant that the next generation had really started to find its own voice. There's little argument that the mid-seasons of the next generation were its best, so this episode comes at a time that really is the best of both worlds. In one sense, it marked the point when the troubled early seasons were left behind. On the other hand, it signalled a confident march into a golden age, boldly going where Star Trek had not gone before, a fourth season. Next Gen had started off being fueled by rejected scripts from the original series. It had a lack of direction and its own personality, but here is where it really became its own distinct success. So what makes the best of both worlds so unique and impressive that fans feel compelled to make and watch videos about it over three decades after its release? Let's start with what it did differently. First up, this was Star Trek's first proper two-parter. I know what you're going to say, that might seem unfair. The original series had the Menagerie, and Next Gen's pilot was a two-parter. In both cases though, these are kind of single stories with an extended framing device. The Menagerie spliced in unused footage from the unaired pilot. It's a barnstormer of an episode, but its existence feels like it was at least partially justified by the fact that they had a bunch of footage laying around which could serve to show some flashbacks. Case in point, they probably wouldn't have had Spock giggling like a schoolgirl if they had written this episode from scratch. Next Gen's pilot, Encounter at Farpoint, is sort of a two-parter, though it was never intended to be that, and it lacks the build-up cliffhanger resolution structure. It was a single episode script that was, under studio orders, stretched to double length at pretty much last minute by adding an extended B-plot. The Q character was not in the original story that Dorothy wrote. By design and necessity, because the writer and some cast weren't guaranteed to return in season 4, Next Gen's Best of Both Worlds really was intended to be written as a two-parter. It's also the first episode to close the season with a to-be-continued cliffhanger. That's a handful of firsts already, but this episode pioneered so much more. There were a bunch of distinct aspects that you just didn't get in Star Trek at this point. The stakes were greater than any story before, with Earth and the Federation directly threatened in a way that really feels credible. Your people will be assimilated as easily as Picard has been. It's kind of a surprise to watch it all play out. It's not just that there's tension and this isn't some enemy with a personal vendetta. Everything is on the line, and it generally feels like our heroes are constantly on the back foot. Everything goes from bad to worse, and it really doesn't seem like there's a way to stop this enemy. It's the kind of intense stuff that you might get from the movies, but this was a big swing for sci-fi television. It's all pulled off with top-tier production values as well. Now, it's fair to say that this wasn't the first time successfully pulling off something of this scale, and nowadays you can do this kind of movie-type stuff with ease, but this was sci-fi TV in the 90s. It was still often pretty ropey-looking, stilted stuff. Doing something like this, and having it look great without cutting corners, wasn't often done on this scale back then. The best of both worlds made it seem effortless. What else stands out? Well, it wasn't just the spectacle of it all. You had much more in-depth character work too. You had the hero suddenly become an unwitting villain. Everyone was concerned because their colleagues were wiped out at Wolf 359, and they're facing the spectre of killing their captain. They might not even get there in time to stop it all. 
This wasn't a big happy crew versus the bad guys. And on that note, a notable element comes with the introduction of an ambitious, intelligent new character, Commander Shelby. She joins the main crew and starts disrupting proceedings by making demands and calling out Commander Riker. With a prime directive from the series creator that typically prohibited interpersonal conflict, it really raises an eyebrow to hear someone that we don't even know laying into Riker, accusing him of hanging on to Picard's coattails and telling him he doesn't have what it takes to be a leader. I suppose that's why someone like you sits in the shadow of a great man for as long as you have, passing up one command after another. It was a new experience to have our heroes legitimately looked down on and called out like that. It makes Riker, and I'm going to be brutally honest here, interesting. He deserves to be challenged for repeatedly turning down his own command, and Shelby is voicing some legitimate concerns about his character, and I mean that in every sense of the word. His limitations have been highlighted, he's rightly framed as someone who's not the right guy for the job, he's up against it and so is the audience. Success hangs on him doing what he's refused to so far Drugs. and stepping up to fill the captain's chair. It's a pretty interesting arc. Fact is though that everybody gets something meaningful to do to contribute towards the plot. My favourite moment in the whole episode is this. The Borg have neither honour nor courage. That is our greatest advantage. It's just a nice moment with Worf. And it sounds like a typical vague Klingon honour platitude but it does pay off when you pay attention. When it looks increasingly likely that all is lost, the crew take the bold decision to liberate Captain Picard from the Borg. They are in dire straits. They could have just said, we can't risk it, but they had the courage to do the honourable thing and save him from his tormentor. When so much fiction almost gleefully enjoys indulging in justifying those do what it takes, sentimentality is for simps tropes, we get to see how doing the humane thing is the key to saving humanity. It's the principal philosophy of Star Trek. As we get towards the finale, it's worth noting that the writers felt conflicted about the small scale ending to this episode, but this is absolutely the pinnacle of Star Trek. Against all odds, they choose to do the right thing, and it comes down to our smart, dedicated crew of experts working together and combining their skills to find a solution. They saved their captain's life against all odds. Even two typically unsung crew members pointedly get to actually contribute to saving the day. Troy's empathic psychology puts them on the right track, telling them that Picard is trying to help them. Dr. Crusher just knows how Picard thinks and figures out what he's trying to say. Outside of the box thinking, discovers the solution, and everyone employs their engineering and scientific know-how to make it so. And we get loads of O'Brien. This was necessitated by LeVar Burton being unavailable for filming in part two, but still, more O'Brien is always a good thing. The characters and actors got stretched in ways that they hadn't before, and this two-parter expanded the limits of what a Star Trek episode could do. In a way that would define him from this point on, we do get two moments of deep characterization for Captain Picard in just two short, silent scenes. By the way, this... <laughs> is less emotional than this. And this... is more impactful than this. <laughs> yeah. Back to the point. Back to the best of both worlds going way beyond being just a two-parter. The second episode of season four, Family, is a direct coda to the best of both worlds. This again is extremely unusual, as serialized shows, especially Star Trek, intentionally try to avoid character and story continuity. The idea of kicking off the actual series run with a quiet, boring introspection of the protagonist's PTSD is unheard of. We again have that unusual interpersonal conflict in the friction between Picard and his family, and our stoic, professional leader winds up breaking down in tears, berating himself for not being strong enough to stand against what the Borg did to him. So The Best of Both Worlds is actually Trek's best three-parter. Even that doesn't do it enough justice. Remember this? 
We'll just have to see how ready you are. Kill! Magnify. Let's go back to where it all got started. The cyberspace zombies make their debut in what's generally considered the first great episode of the next generation, when the crew are introduced to them by Q. The hall is rented, the orchestra engaged. It's now time to see if you can dance. It should be noted, by the way, that this is not the whimsical, impish, fun guy at the party Q, right. but a capricious, all-powerful tormentor who is frankly really being dangerous. He takes exception to Picard's confidence and brings the Enterprise face to face with the Borg. It's a disaster. Nothing works to stop their invasive curiosity, then outright hostility. Diplomacy, science, brute force, it all fails. With crew dying and his ship about to be destroyed, Picard has to literally beg the villain of the peace to save them. What the Borg brought out in this story and character in those early days was incredible. Picard does have the wisdom to reflect that they've just been shown what's really out there and that they better be ready for it, but damn, the Borg almost literally brought the main character of the show to his knees. Then they abduct and assimilate him, and then he's still suffering even through the power of serialized 90s television reset buttons. So best of both worlds is Trek's best four-parter? Or best four-parter and a film, since First Contact does kind of carry on directly from this. Or best four-parter in a film and a whole other series 30 years later. Plus there's all the other episodes of The Next Generation with the Borg in. And boy did Voyager start leaning on the presence of them to carry it along. I think it's simplest to just say that the influence of the best of both worlds is hard to overstate. They had the guts to go big and it paid off. They took risks and made something special. So what's the takeaway from all of this? Well my suggestion is go and watch the best of both worlds. Go for it. Treat yourself. It still holds up.